Take your Bibles with me this morning and turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. If you've been attending our church or are a member of our church, we're in a, a series entitled Simple Obedience, and we've been looking at the commands of Jesus. And there was question about whether we would jump out of that or stay in that during the Easter service. And we have come to verse 48 in our text, and because it fits, I think, very well with what Easter is all about, we're going to use this verse as our text for our Easter sermon today. Following a number of commands that Jesus has already given in this text, in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says these words, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. We use the word perfect to describe numerous things in our world today. Something coming together at just the right moment in just the right way, we call that the perfect thing, the perfect storm. Sometimes as a sigh of frustration, we'll say, that's just perfect, right? One of our former presidents uses this word a lot to describe pretty much anything he does. That was the perfect speech. It was the perfect phone call. He's referring to something that he's done without error. But what must we do and what must be maintained to truly reach perfection? Perfection. If you've paid attention at all to baseball as the opening of the season has happened and transpired over the last week, week and a half, our Tampa Rays are off to a what? An 8-0 and start. Undefeated. It's one of the best starts in baseball in the last decades. But for it to be the perfect season, it would have to culminate in winning the World Series. And even then, I can almost guarantee you they're not going to go 162-0. and that, that can't happen, right? Perfection seems to be this completely unattainable thing. And yet Jesus commands us in this text, be perfect. Exactly what is Jesus commanding us to do here? Well, I think as we look at this text... When we hear these words, all kinds of things probably come to our mind. Well, this must be what Jesus meant, and we, we have our own ideas of that. And so I want to clarify, first of all, a definition of this by looking at how we misunderstand perfection and misunderstand perfection in relationship to what Jesus has said here. This verse causes all kinds of consternation as we hear it because it echoes other passages of Scripture that seem just as impossible for us. In the Old Testament law, Leviticus 19.2 said this, Be holy. This is God speaking to his people. Be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. You ever tried to be holy? Deuteronomy 18.13 is actually most likely the background to our verse that we have here in Matthew 5.48. In it, God says, you must be blameless. And in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's the same word as perfect here in Matthew 5, 48. You must be this blameless, perfect word before the Lord your God. So what is Jesus commanding? What, what isn't he saying? I think, first of all, a misunderstanding of this text is if we understand this word perfect to mean sinlessness. You must be sinless. There is a strain of evangelical Christianity, more precisely stemming and coming out of the Wesleyan tradition, that believes followers of Jesus can literally fulfill Jesus' command here. You can be perfect. Now, we know that all believers are destined one day for perfection. We will be perfect when we are glorified, right, on the, the other side of this life, when Jesus returns and when we are raised to life again, we will be like Christ. We will be glorified like Christ was glorified after his resurrection. 
And this is the completion of the process of salvation for each and every person who trusts and believes in Jesus Christ as Lord. And in fact, God now looks at his believers, those who are in Jesus Christ, as already been made perfect or here is our word again, and it's found in Hebrews chapter 10, 14. If we are believers in Christ, God views us this way because he views us in Christ. And as Galatians 2, 20 tells us, we have been crucified with Christ and we have Christ living in us. So as God looks at us, he sees Christ's perfection in us. But currently, you and I live between these two great poles of history, the comings of Jesus Christ His first coming in which he accomplished the works of salvation, but then we await his second coming where we aren't glorified yet, but we live in this in-between. We are justified or made right with God when by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our need of a Savior, that we are sinners, we fall short of the very glory of God, we can't save ourselves, and then we look to that work that Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. We live by that faith that we place in Jesus' work. But what is our experience of living by faith like? Do you feel like you're perfect right now? Do you feel completely sinless? You know, Paul describes the Christian life in much the same way Jesus describes it here in this sermon a call, a summon to live by the Spirit rather than by the flesh, obeying the commands that Jesus lays out rather than the desires of our flesh. And this this tradition that believes we can live sinless actually believes that if we place our faith in Jesus Christ, we can perfectly live like Christ in fulfillment of this command. And at some point in our process known as sanctification, our our being made holy, being made like Christ, at somewhere, even in this life, in that process, we will reach a stage of perfection where we will no longer sin. And that sounds great. But again, I ask, experientially, I don't know about you, I have not arrived there yet. I was driving over to the sunrise service this morning and was still getting frustrated at the fact that I was sitting at a red light and there's nobody coming and I'm voicing my frustration. When I'm perfected, those frustrations will go away. I don't think this describes our life. Further passages like 1 John 1 would suggest that if we say we don't sin anymore, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us, 1 John 1, 8. In fact, most that believe that we can be sinless, and that's what Christ is commanding here, describe this sinlessness as a perfect life lived in their actions. What they do is without sin, but not necessarily their thought life, and yet Everything that Jesus has said so far in this sermon, if you've been with our sermon series so far, is it's not just about the outside action. I'm after the heart. What's the motivation? What is the attitude? Because even those are affected by sin. So it's misunderstanding to think that Jesus is calling us to complete sinlessness here. Some go the other way, and another misunderstanding of this is just do your best. It's the opposite extreme of perfection. And what they think or some think is what Jesus is calling us here to is that we just give it our best shot. And this goal is placed before us as something to pursue, to go after with all of our best efforts. And at the end of the day, if you and I have done our best, God will allow us to dwell with him in his presence forever. And maybe that sounds like you this morning. That's how you view it. If, if I asked you today, if you were to come into the very presence of God and he would ask you, why should I let you into heaven? What would your answer be? And some of you would say, well, I'm a good person. I've lived a good life. I've done my best. 
But doing your best always leaves the contemplative proponent of this view wondering if they've done enough to get into God's good graces. Remember as a child growing up in school, I w- we were, T and I went to school together, we grew up together at least in high school, and in that era of the 1980s of school and into the early 1990s, your teachers still used things like grade books, right? There was no online experience yet for us. I remember taking my first computer class in middle school, and it was, you know, the, the dark screen with the orange letters, right, and the big five and a quarter or five and a half inch floppy disk, and it was a floppy disk, right, and you stuck it in there to make DOS boot up and then to get your computer running and everything else. But I was one of those kids who strove to make A's, right? Like I was an A student. But there was always that question, where are you in your grade throughout the semester? And you're, you had no access to that. The teacher had the grade book. You just kind of had to wait till the report card came. You had no idea. You kind of hoped you measured up. It's not like today where... Five minutes after they take the test, the student wants to know what they got with the grade, and they want constant reminders, and the parents are all over the teachers going, what is my student's grade? Drives teachers nuts, I'm imagining today. But we don't get that kind of access. But I think it's the same experience for the person who's trying to live up to perfection, trying to live up to just doing your best. How do you know if you're actually making the grade? I don't think that's what Jesus is telling us here. Further, if this was the issue, remember what he said already earlier in this same sermon in verse 20. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of God. If it's based on me doing my best, My best would have to exceed the best of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. To put it bluntly, no one today orders their life along the level of obedience or reaches the level of obedience that those individuals did. And yet, their best wasn't good enough, according to Jesus. Well, others conclude from this, this is just referencing an impossibility. We can't do this. We can't be perfect. Because we can't live up to it, and it can't be about just doing our best. There must be another way. And and there is some truth in this, that the other way is found in Jesus, the work of Jesus Christ. And this is solely the grace of God that is at work, and we rely on that, and we do absolutely nothing. And there's theological truth in that, and we'll come back to that. But I don't think that's what this passage is about, at least fully. Why? Because why does Jesus give us the command then to be perfect? It's a command that's attached to action. Everything that he has commanded so far in this sermon has been about we are to do certain things or live a certain way or act in a certain way toward enemies or toward others or toward even friends, family members. Why would Jesus give us a command if we can't do it? Second, this view that it is impossible can easily lead us to conclude that grace does abound and that's truth and so all I have to do is really express faith and then I can live however I want to live. And that's obviously not what Jesus is talking about in this sermon. Here's the conclusion of the misunderstandings. The last misunderstanding of perfection is to understand this word to mean perfection. May I suggest that our English word perfect does not capture well what Jesus is talking about at all in this text. It carries too much morality baggage with it. And therefore, I don't think Jesus is telling us to be perfect like we tend to think of perfection. So what is Jesus actually commanding here? And this is the hub of our sermon this morning. He is giving us this command. Here's the simple command. Be whole. Be whole. 
The Greek word here is teleos, the adjective form of telos, telic, end. We sometimes bring that word into English. But this word means undivided. It means complete. And it is used in a number of passages in the New Testament and even in the Gospel of Matthew to describe something or some event as coming to its end or coming to completion. The hour had come or ended. It had been finished. And as an extension then of this idea of completeness, it also has the idea of if something is complete, then it is whole. It is undivided. Now, I've, over the past few years, really started to get into cooking. You know that by the fact that I actually ask for cooking stuff for Christmas. That's pretty nuts. But I like it. It's a fun hobby for me, and I enjoy doing it. And I am a bit of a perfectionist, and so I want it to be perfect when I do it. And one of the tricks of cooking, as you've done it for any period of time, is as you're making it, you try the dish, right, to see how it's coming along. And this is one of the real frustrations about dessert, because you make that cake, or you make that pie, or you make that dessert, and then you're going to present it like you're going to take it to an Easter dinner after services this morning. They don't like it so much if the sliver has already been cut out of the dessert, and I want to do that so badly because I want to taste it to see, does this taste right? Because you just don't know, especially if it's one you've never done before. But that's the idea of this word. It's something that is whole, undivided. It's not cut up yet. It's not, part of it hasn't been taken out. All of it is there. So what is Jesus commanding us here to do then? What is he commanding when he says, be whole? How can we be whole? What is wholeness? May I suggest three things out of the text here and out of the gospel. Wholeness is, first of all, attained through Christ's completed work. It begins with grace. Because all of our efforts, Isaiah 64 tells us, are what? Filthy rags. It's even grosser than that. It's blood and pus-stained bandages is that word. All of our good deeds before God look like that because they cannot measure up to a holy God. Therefore, we cannot attain right standing with God. You cannot make yourself right with God. And we must realize that our good works, our doing our best, will never attain what Christ is commanding here. We fall short, Romans 3.23, of the glory of God because we commit sin in our actions and in our thoughts. Thinking back just on what Jesus has said, who hasn't been angry at someone in their life? Who hasn't lusted after someone else in their life? Who hasn't failed to tell the absolute truth in everything that they have said? Who hasn't retaliated when wrong has been done to them? Who hasn't harbored hatred or bitterness toward an enemy of theirs? I think all of us would have to admit we've done these things, and most of us, I think, could say we've done all of those in the past week. But there is one who hasn't done any of these things, Jesus Christ. This is why he is our Savior. He lived a perfectly sinless life. He was, here's our word, wholly devoted to the will of his heavenly Father. And aren't you grateful and thankful that he was? He was pressured not to. Even his own I think self in his humanity struggled with that. We know it in the garden itself where he's saying, if it would be at all possible, do not let me have to go through this suffering. But he says, nevertheless, it's not my will that must be done. It is your will, Father, to be done. And he submitted wholly to the will of his Father. Therefore, his life of perfect obedience 
and his nature as God. That's the, the verses that are here from Colossians 2. For in him, the wholeness, the undividedness, the completeness, the fullness of deity, what it means to be God, dwelt in him bodily, in his body. What a truth that is. He was truly God. The incarnation, Jesus coming to this earth, being born into this earth, truly God, truly human. But it wasn't just enough that Jesus came. He would have to die. And yet there's a, there's a gap between coming, his incarnation and his death. You see, if Jesus would have died as an infant, it wouldn't have taken away your sins. I don't believe it would have. Why? Because Jesus didn't do what he says he does in here in Matthew chapter 5. What did Jesus actively do? He fulfilled all the law. Meaning he lived a life of sinlessness so that he could bring the law to its completion. He could end it. And in so doing, in fulfilling everything that the law commanded Jesus to do, he could then be that perfect sacrifice for us. He lived the perfect life in obedience to his Father. He then laid down his life of his own will at the cross. Yes, he was put to death by Roman soldiers at the behest of the Jewish leadership of that day. But as Jesus says, you're... I give my life. I lay it down. It's of my authority because he has the authority as God to do that. This one who was truly God, perfectly obey God, and his nature is fully and truly God, laid down his life as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for all of humanity's sins, your sins, my sins, the sins of what? The whole world. And at the end of that sacrifice, on that cross, as he's coming to the end of that sacrifice, it's not in Matthew's gospel. I wish it was because it would work so much better for my sermon. But John does record it in John 19, verse 30. Matthew says he cried with a loud voice and he gave up his spirit. John tells us what that loud cry was. What were those? It's actually one Greek word, but it is this word perfected in its verb form. Tetelestai. It is complete. It is finished. It is whole. And that sacrifice of Jesus Christ brought wholeness. It's done. And yet such a sacrifice would leave us hopeless if Jesus simply succumbed to sin and death by dying on a cross. He didn't just die. What did he do? He rose from the dead. Yes, the sacrifice was complete, but it wasn't just enough to cover our sin. He wants to give us life, eternal life, his life. He wants to dwell in us. And so Jesus rose from the dead. On that first Sunday after his death, he came out of that tomb. It had no grip or hold on him. And sin and death in all of its power was not enough to chain and hold the Son of God. He defeated sin and death, and he has made that life available to all who don't try to do their best, but to all who look to him as their savior. My right standing, God, is not found in me. It's found in your son, Jesus Christ, and I confess that I'm a sinner and I need his sacrifice to save me, redeem me, and make, you, make me right with you again and to give me his life.
That's salvation. Jesus is commanding here, be whole, and it's something that he has attained through his completed work. Secondly, it is received through a wholehearted belief in Christ's completed work. Here is the command coming to us. Be whole. Place your confidence, your trust in this finished, complete work of Christ that has been done for you. You have to trust this. You have to give your heart to this reality. There's one other place in Matthew's gospel where this idea of the word teleos, wholeness, comes about. And it's a rather interesting illustration. Look over in Matthew chapter 19 with me. Jesus is teaching. He teaches on divorce and God's view of marriage and he teaches his disciples, as crowds are gathering and holding back children, to let the little children come to me. And just then, verse 16 says this, a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? Someone approaches Jesus and wants what Jesus is offering, wants eternal life. What good thing must I do? And Jesus says, why do you ask me about what is good? There are is only one who is good. If you want to enter life, keep the commandments. Keep his commandments. The only one that is good is the Father. Keep the commands of the Father. Which ones, the man asked. Jesus lists out some of the commandments from the Torah, the law, the covenant of Israel. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. Some of these same ones we've been looking at in the Sermon on the Mount. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and mother. Love your neighbor as yourself. All these I have kept, the man said. What do I still lack? He doesn't have the certainty of eternal life, and his outward actions have been all about doing these things. I've done them all, he says. And here's where our word comes in. Jesus answered, If you want to be perfect, if you want to, and again, I don't think the word is sinless here. I think it's whole. If you want to be whole, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. And when the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. We'll come to this story later in the commands of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew. But it's interesting. This man has done everything. He's kept the law. And yet Jesus says, if you want real wholeness, you have to lay down that thing that you are looking to for security. You have to lay down that whatever it is, and for this man it was money, but this other thing that occupied his heart. Because Jesus isn't about a divided heart. Jesus didn't come and offer himself so that we would give him half of our heart or commit kind of to him. He wants us. He wants all of us. He wants, again, not just the action. He wants the heart. He wants the motivation. He wants it all. One must be willing to lay aside all trust in the things of this earth and follow Jesus. What Jesus is telling this man and what he's telling us in Matthew 5 is this, that his followers are to be wholly committed to him and what he calls them to. The question that asks or comes to us this morning is this. Are you willing to lay aside your confidence and your trust in the things of this world and wholly trust and commit your life to the completed work of Christ? That's what Jesus is commanding. 
I don't want part of you. I want the undivided whole. I want all of it. And when that takes place, wholeness is mirrored in our undivided allegiance like our Heavenly Father. Be perfect. And it doesn't just stop there. As your Heavenly Father is perfect. Now it is true that God is perfect in righteousness, holiness. He is sinless. He is all of those other parts to this. But what Jesus wants us to see about the Father and his nature and his character that we are to emulate is a wholeness. God is undivided in himself. God is undivided in his nature. God isn't half committed to you. God is all in. And he's calling us to be the same. And when we are, we are mirroring the very character and nature of our Heavenly Father. As we've seen in chapter 5 of Matthew, all of the commands that Jesus gives about speaking truth, about purity in, in our relationships, even sexual purity, in about anger, in about love for enemy, all of these things are exactly descriptive of who God is and how God acts toward us. And again, Jesus is calling us here To this same thing, God is whole in his commitment to us. There is no division. There is no dividedness in God. And in fact, the rest of the Sermon on the Mount will play this out. It will build off of this command. You cannot serve two masters. We are not to do deeds of prayer and charity on the outside simply to be seen by others. To earn brownie points with God. We are to seek God's kingdom and allow him to provide what we need. And the danger always in a service like this on an Easter Sunday is that when we gather together and we come to church, especially on big holidays, there's always a tendency to have some in here who you come to church on Christmas, you come on Easter, you come on those big days. But if you were honest with yourself, your commitment to Christ, your commitment to his body, his church, only takes place on those big holy days, those big holidays. If God was to take an assessment of your heart, would he say it's wholly given to him? Would he say it's undivided in its trust and its allegiance to him? The main idea of this text this morning is this. Jesus makes us whole. It is attained through his completed work. We get to receive it as we place our trust in that completed work. And when we do that, his spirit is sent into our lives so that our lives now mirror the undivided character, nature, and allegiance that our Father has toward us as his people. Jesus wants to do that work in your life. He wants to do that work in Clearwater Community Church. He wants this whole church to be a picture of himself. This isn't just about fixes. This past week, we have one daughter down at Palm Beach Atlantic, and uh, she has uh, a car that we have gotten from another church family in our uh, body here, and it's, it's an older car, and it was dirt cheap, and that's why we bought it off of them, and it served highly well for a year and a half but Aaron's old car is starting to show that it might be on its last legs. And so it was having issues, and Hallie had to go out of town, so we dropped it off at the mechanics on Thursday, and it's in there to figure out what's all going wrong. And I 
There's all kinds of problems with this car. We know that. It's just like, just get it roadworthy, okay? I mean, we don't need you to fix all the electric. It's a 2002 Lincoln Continental, fully loaded. But think about a 20-year-old car with all of its electronics going haywire. That's what's happening, okay? I haven't heard back from the mechanic yet. It's Easter weekend. I understand, right? I'll get this call tomorrow, and he's going to probably have all kinds of things. And then I'm going to have to make a decision. Do we, do we fix the car? And if we invest a bunch of money in it, we probably can get it running again. But for how much longer? You see, I think a lot of us look to Jesus and want him to fix us. Jesus isn't coming to fix us. Jesus gave his life to give you a new life. That's what really Hallie needs, a brand new car. Mom and dad aren't going to be able to provide that. That's fine. But that's what's needed. That's what's on offer to you. Jesus isn't coming to fix you. If you give your heart to him, he will give you new life. If anyone is in Jesus Christ... That person is a new creation. Now that doesn't mean, again, that we will be completely sinless this side of glory, but all of life makes much more sense, and eternal life is there. That was what was being offered to that man that came to Jesus. That's what he walked away from that day because he wanted to hold on to the things of this world. He wanted eternal life, but he wanted his way, And Jesus says, I'm not offering that. This is what I've got. This is how you are made whole. Relinquish your hold on this world and embrace me. He rose so that we might have new life. We might have his life. We might have eternal life. The question for you this morning is, have you been made whole by Jesus Christ. I'm not asking if you are a good person. The Pharisees did all the right things. They did it all right externally, but inwardly they weren't committed to God's righteousness because we know that they didn't want God's offer of his son. They didn't want Jesus Christ. They wanted fixes. As Jesus will say in the rest of the sermon, they were hypocrites. And sometimes when we hear that word hypocrite, we think of somebody who says one thing and does something else. That's not hypocrite. That's a liar. A hypocrite is actually the person who I think thinks they're right with God and they do all of the religious stuff. They do the prayer. They do the fasting. They do the church attendance. But their heart isn't committed to Jesus Christ. That's the hypocrite. It looks all good. And you've deceived yourself. Because there's not a real relationship with God through his son. The question we have for us today and before us here in this command to be whole, have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ? And are you willing to follow wherever he directs your life? One of the songs that we used to sing, and we still sing it here at church occasionally, but we used to sing it at the invitation at the end. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. May I ever love and trust him and in his presence daily live. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. That second verse, I think, hits us hard. All to Jesus I surrender. Make me Savior, and here's our word, holy thine, W-H-O-L-L-Y completely yours. Let me feel thy Holy Spirit truly knowing that thou art mine. We sing those words, but do we mean it? Do you mean that? That you surrender and are willing to give it all up so that Jesus can be yours. That you are holy, H-W-O-L-L-Y, his. He did that for us. He became us 
so that we could have his life. Do you have that resurrection life today? Are you whole? Lord, as we close this service down this morning, I pray that your spirit would work in the hearts of everyone here this morning. Because I think, Lord, all of us need to hear this command of Jesus and assess Am I one who has embraced the work that Jesus Christ has done? And is my heart right now giving its full allegiance to Jesus Christ? Lord, if there are some here this morning who've not placed their faith and trust in the completed work of Jesus Christ, they're relying on their good works. They're relying on their righteousness. They want a relationship with you, but they will not relinquish control of a certain part of their life to follow you. I pray, God, that you would do a work, a convicting work through your spirit to show them the error, the hypocrisy, the absolute futility and foolishness eternally of that choice. And Lord, bring them to a place where today they give their heart to Christ. They turn over their life, they confess their sin, and they embrace the work of Jesus Christ. And they begin that journey of following him through the power of your spirit. God, do that work today. And Lord, for those of us who place our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, may we hear these words and see again in, with fresh eyes, forgiven eyes, eyes that are turning again to the cross and the empty tomb to realize that that work has been done, that we have been given new life in Jesus Christ, but that new life calls us to live that resurrection life now so that we mirror you, Lord, our Heavenly Father. Thank you for your commitment to us. Thank you for the sacrifice of your Son that we may be made whole. And may we be wholly devoted to you today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.